No, it's not Halloween yet, but the Grim Reaper for new cars comes in spring and summer when automakers clarify what's coming back for the new model year and what's not. High Gear Media editors John Volker, Nelson Irison, and Bengt Halverson read our roundup from editorial director Marty Paget, then got together to talk through what did or didn't make the cut. The Acura TL and the TSX, they're both going away uh, this model year. Um, they're going to be replaced by a single model, uh, the TLX. Uh, I think that's smart marketing, but with Mercedes-Benz replacing, you know, bringing in the CLA and Audi bringing in the A3, um, what do you guys think about, about Acura's one-car strategy? Well... well Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. I was just going to say, Acura also has the ILX, remember, underneath the new TLX. Of uncertain future, <laughs> they say. Yes. Uh, yeah, they do. So, in a way, it kind of makes sense to streamline their, their model line, I think. But on the other hand, if you look at it, like Cadillac just recently went away from an in-between model in the C CTS that was kind of not quite 3 Series, not quite 5 Series, you know, it wasn't quite compact, it wasn't quite full-size sedan, uh, is in-between. Acura had the TL, which was pretty close to full-size, and the TSX, which was pretty compact, and now they're kind of going away from that back into a, a tweener-sized car, uh, which really bodes very poorly, I think, for the ILX underneath it. It's going to get axed, and they're just going to have this one sedan. Uh, and that works if you're trying to establish a foothold, I think, in luxury, and you want to grab people from both sides, you know, people who don't want to pay for a full size and maybe who want a little bit more than a pure compact. Uh, but that's not where Acura should be at this point in the market, you know. Um, but Acura has changed direction so many times in the last few years, you know. Oh, we're going for Tier 1 status. Oh, we're going for entry-level premium. You know, which is it? Um, and I think that's being reflected in the products that we're seeing right now and the, the exit of the TL and TSX. Yeah, and uh, we, we will have uh, some more thoughts on the TLX uh, pretty soon, uh, just, just as, a, as a heads up. Uh, yeah. the, the next one, uh, the BMW 1 Series, uh, we, we saw that one coming. That's no surprise. It's just being replaced by the 2 Series. Uh, Let's let's skip um, let's skip to some of the more interesting ones. Um, well, uh, the Chevy Malibu Eco and the Impala Eco. It looks like GM is largely abandoning their um, their Eco badge. Uh, is is that smart, or is that just a, a matter of um, the the wrong marketing steps at the wrong time and 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 pricing and packaging? I think it's some of the, some of each. Um, I'm not convinced that the eco badge is dead yet, but the frustrating thing about all of this is that they did the same thing with the previous generation of this mild hybrid system uh, on the Malibu when exactly the same thing happened on the previous car. They had introduced this eco version with the mild hybrid system, then they introduced an upgraded engine, base four-cylinder engine. Lo and behold, it, that car was a couple of thousand dollars cheaper, got almost as good mileage, guess what? Eco sales fell off. They seem to be doing the same thing now that they've got the new 2.5 liter uh, four-cylinder engine for both of those vehicles, which we've driven. Um, nonetheless, I'm told that GM is working on yet a third generation of this mild hybrid system. So whether or not the Eco badge survives for Chevrolet, they still have them in Buicks. Um, the thought is maybe they will apply to other vehicles, but they seem to be sticking with the technology, just applied very inconsistently. Mm -hmm. Nelson, thoughts? Uh, the, the, the thing that always concerned me with the Eco branding is that it's just a boost short of Eco Boost, which is kind of their crosstown rivals thing. <laughs> you know? um, there are better ways to brand that, I think, and the fact that they keep dropping it and coming back to it just hints that maybe they don't have any better ideas for what badge to stick on it. Like, the idea is good, but as, as John pointed out, you know, they keep one-upping themselves on the technology front, and I think the lack of a coherent brand where they can maybe slide in those other upgraded engines, you know, is is part of that problem. Yeah. Like, I this mean, is what we're 
doing for greener cars? I, I think a lot of it comes back to, to mileage figures, and, and if if a car with the Eco Badge is only doing you know one or two miles per gallon combined better than uh, the standard model that may cost thousands less, they don't have a good uh, a good selling point. And so um, you know it, it I, I feel like yeah it it happened with Chevy a few years ago. It happened with the green the Saturn Green Line models that GM was trying to to um, move and and. They they need to find a new way. Otherwise, it's 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 GM is stuck in a loop with with these these eco models. Uh, let's move on to something more exciting, which is uh, uh, convertibles. Uh, so so two um, convertibles with eh, kind of I, I guess I'd say interesting reputations are are leaving the market this year. Uh, the Chrysler 200 convertible. And then the Nissan Murano Cross Cabriolet. Uh, both of the one of these models has kind of a reputation for being a, a staple of rental car fleets, and and then the the Cross Cabriolet is is probably you know one of the models that we were thinking of when um, when we just wondered how you know what were they thinking when it arrived on the market. Um, it, thoughts on where both of these. It, if if either of these automakers gain something through the reputation of these cars, yeah, um, the Chrysler 200 being the evolution of the Sebring uh, was a necessity for Chrysler at the time and played its role, I think. But it is well and rightfully put to bed uh, in, in all of its forms. Uh, as soon as possible. It, it's just not a very good car, and it's not up to the standard of Chrysler's other new cars these days. You know, it doesn't fit with the lineup. It needs to go away. Uh, the Murano Cross Cabriolet is an oddity. It is a relic, almost, of, of a different kind of automotive past. You know, like, those cars don't get made these days. These things that are just conceptual and design-oriented. I mean, it's not a pretty car, by most accounts, but the people who like it have this crazy attraction to it, and they're really, you know, really drawn to this odd convertible SUV crossover thing. Um, I can see that it had a limited time in the market and a limited place, and it's time for it to go along as well. But I wouldn't be surprised if Nissan did something odd like that again, possibly in the near future. Mm -hmm. Regarding the 200, I'd just say that back in the very first generation of Sebrings, people kind of forget Chrysler really reintroduced the convertible as a sort of a mass market car at a time when in the mid 70s there had been a thought that all the convertibles would go away forever. It did very well for them because pe there weren't competitors in the rest of the I guess then compact or now mid-sized market but given that they have a new 200 derived from the underpinnings of the Dodge Dart and several Italian cars you know, Chrysler's got much, much bigger problems right now than not having a convertible in its lineup. They'd probably like to do it. Maybe at some future point when the Chrysler Fiat Enterprise is a little bit more stable, they'll return to it. But for the moment, they got to figure out how to make cars that people want to buy, and convertibles are pretty low on the priority list. Let's jump over to the Nissan Cube. Um, this is a model where when it came out four years ago, I think, um, it, it really pushed the design envelope in a way that, you know, uh, was, gained some mixed reviews. And, and it's a little, it's a little postmodern. It's a little rolling lounge. Uh, I remember the uh, designers sort of pointing, proudly pointing to the the uh, uh, liquid drops, you know, molded into the ceiling. Uh, the sort of uh, center console modeled after a, a jacuzzi, the rim of a jacuzzi uh, tub, and 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 uh, you know I don't, I had my doubts that this model was going to you know just hit its mark with the mass market. Then um, it really hasn't, and so it, the model's going away. I wish Nissan just recast this model um, in the vein of. Uh, the sort of uh, basic, squared-off, chopped-off, more butch 
van-like look that um, had, I think, had brought the cube to this country in the first place. Um, sorry, but just had to jump to my thoughts on this. Um, what do you guys? How, how do you guys think that you know the cube worked in this country as it was presented to us? To me, the cube is of a piece with um, another another sort of attempt by Nissan at doing something that was just a little too over-designed. The, the big success in that tall wagon market is clearly the Kia Soul. I mean, that thing just dominates the sum total of all of the rest of the little sort of tall box wagons. And I happen to like the idea of an asymmetric car um, that has a wrapper on <laughs> windows only on one corner, but um, it just never made it. Their, the sales had plummeted, and so they were right to yank it. They can use the space for selling more Sentras or something like that. Um, didn't it also have a little place on the dashboard you were supposed to put a, a little tuft of live grass? Or am I misremembering? I, you know, that sounds familiar. I can't remember for sure. I'm get, you know, That's we true. get it confused with the flower vase and the, and but but there were some there were definitely some interesting. Uh, styling cues built into that car and the the asymmetry. Yeah, you're right. I it, I mean, it's when have we last been presented on the market a vehicle that's so intentionally asymmetrical? <laughs> uh, let's let's uh, move on. I guess a uh, couple a couple of the other models um, that are just not coming back this next year are the Lamborghini Gallardo. Uh, it's just being replaced uh, by the Huracan. Am I pronouncing that right? I think I am. Uh, and the um, Mercedes CL class is gone, replaced by the S class um, S class coupe. Those aren't surprising. Um, let's move on though. Um, the XD isn't coming back. Um, the XD and the XB. If we could have written an anticipated death watch, or maybe we did, I can't remember, um, the, the XD would have probably been in it for the last couple of years. It's been selling really slowly, um, and, and uh, it's been kind of the awkward sibling between the IQ and, and the XB the past several years. Uh, do you see... Scion kind of re-entering this part of the market um, just below the XB. They've mentioned that there, I that I think there's another XB on the way. Do you see Scion kind of making room for a new XD? Go ahead, Nelson. Uh, I mean, I I think Scion needs to play in that space given their sort of mercurial brand image, because the IQ is not a great car. It's tiny, but that's about all it has going for it. And the XB has gotten progressively larger uh, to the point where it's not a small car, really, anymore. Um, so with the only thing else left in their lineup is the Toyota Subaru sports car, they really need some kind of meat and potatoes, affordable four or five passenger small car to get people around in. They just need something that's not the XD. The rumors, the rumors are that uh, there are two new Scions coming. One is a spinoff of the new Mazda 2, which is also going to spawn a replacement for the Toyota Yaris. The Yaris will probably be the hatchback. Oddly, the rumor is that Scion's going to get the sedan version, their first ever sedan, in the subcompact level. Um, it may be that the XD actually gets replaced by the other rumored car, which is a version of the Toyota Oris, which is effectively a five-door hatchback Toyota Corolla that's sold in Europe, where hatchbacks are much more popular. Um, if those rumors prove true, at least they'll have some new products. Cyan now has an extremely aging lineup. Um, but it's sort of unclear what they mean for the brand image if you go more sort of bland and Corolla and you introduce a sedan. Uh, we'll find out probably within 18 months. Uh, Toyota FJ Cruiser. That's one that... Um it's it's been a relatively so, slow seller. I think I looked up. It's been around you know around ten thousand uh, the past several years, um, and uh, there's really nothing else like it on the market. There's the Wrangler, but uh, 
other than the Wrangler, it's it's uh, it's the only of uh, the the traditional kind of style, you know, stylish um, all-in-one off-roaders, body on frame. Um, that one's going to be missed, and it won't be replaced um, by anything except for the um, TRD off-road uh, forerunner. Hmm. Um, any any thoughts on that one? I guess it had just timed out its current its current product cycle. Well, like I love the boxy looks of the FJ Cruiser. Uh, it's hugely capable off-road. Right? There's no denying with its utility in that regard. But the shape is hugely unaerodynamic. It pre present, presents a massive surface area to the wind, and it is, as a result, viciously inefficient. Like, you can get so far into the single digits gas mileage with that vehicle that, I mean, it's, it's the likes you haven't seen since big block, you know, three-ton trucks of 20 and 30 or 40 years ago. Um, it, you can really delve into very poor gas mileage, and I think that's a, a large part of why that shape isn't coming back even in an updated form. But you, you just can't do that with aerodynamics in today's gas mileage requirements. So. Mm -hmm. It is, however, I'm told, very popular in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Nissan Maxima. We thought a new Mi Nissan Maxima was on the way. We waited um, all year, we, uh, we we thought one was coming to New York. Uh, a, a concept showed up, uh, but it looked like a pretty relatively early concept. Then we were we were it was suggested to us that the production model would closely follow the concept, and then the production model um, hasn't still hasn't arrived, and we're getting into the um, we're getting into the late you know late summer. Uh, do you guys have uh, thoughts or or um, wishes on where the Maxima should go? I, I definitely do. Um, there's a, a lot of uncertainty about the Maxima, and I think, I hope, fingers crossed, this is sort of the enthusiast point of view for the four-door sports car, but um, the IDX was a huge hit on the auto show circuit, and everybody wanted to build it. Nissan said, yes, we're going to build it. And then a few months ago, they said, eh, we're not sure we're going to be able to build it because we can't use that and leverage that architecture across several platforms and get a few different cars out of it to justify the business case behind it because it's a small, lightweight, rear-wheel drive car. Uh, now, if they could figure out a way to maybe leverage some of that architecture across the lineup and improve the Maxima along the way... I, I would not be unhappy with that. Do I think it's likely? No. But that's that's the enthusiast inside me shouting, yes, yes, make it rear-wheel drive. Make the 510, too. I mean, the IDX. Uh, you know, please do that, Nissan. That would be awesome. I could see the case that the Maxima is actually trying to figure out its place in the market. Uh, as you look at the Altima one notch below it, which has steadily gotten larger and more stylish over the last three generations, you know, is the Maxima, which 15, 20 years ago was a volume sedan, uh, sort of moving up to the point where it's relegated to competing against something like these large luxury four-door coupes, the Mercedes-Benz CLS or something, sort of a less expensive but rear-drive version of those. Uh, uh, front drive, sorry. But... Um, you know, what is the Maxima's purpose if the Altima is a largish mid-size car you know, where does it fit? Large cars are never really something Nissan's been known for. So I could see them internally sort of scratching their head and trying to figure out, sure, we can design, based on the concept, this very stylish, low, coupe-like sedan, but what do we do with it? Where, who buys it? Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 pie in the sky in terms of wishes, I'd also like to see the, the Maxima come back as, as a sort of extended wheelbase, you know, based on the IDX, uh, simple rear-wheel drive car. Um, you know, that that uh, sh that sure would be great. Um, it, it also sure would be great to see a production Maxima that looks anything close to the concept that uh, Nakamura presented um I believe was that Detroit this past year where we first saw it. Um, I, I think it was. Um, but that that concept was beautiful, really nicely proportioned, 
Uh, and, and, you know, even if that car ends up with front wheel drive or all wheel drive, it's going to be one of the, the, one of the lookers in the segment. Let's hope they don't, uh, they don't tone it down too much. Um, in terms of, uh, other, other cars that just aren't coming back, um, we've got a couple of others, uh, and, and these two, John's probably going to have a, a little more to comment uh, about, especially, um, the, um, Toyota RAV4 EV. Uh, it was only offered. Uh, it was it was only really a California vehicle. It's not coming back uh, this new model year. Uh, neither is the Fit EV. Um, oh, most of the country never even saw these in dealerships, uh, and they are uh, compliance cars. <laughs> Um, by definition, a compliance car is there not to be meaningful to the market, but to move just enough units to keep the car maker in compliance with California rules. Exactly. Um, and they will sell exactly as many as they have to and not a single one more. Um, Honda actually killed off three of its greener cars. Um, everybody's pretty much forgotten about the FCX Clarity fuel cell vehicle, of which they sold exactly 60, if I remember my numbers, over a six-year period, but um, that's going away because they have another fuel cell car coming late next year. Um, as you noted, the Fit EV is going away and the RAV4 EV from Toyota is also going away. Um, the latter two were always three-year cars, 2012 to 2014. I think the question becomes what compliance cars replace them for the next three-year cycle. For Toyota, it will probably be a fuel cell vehicle. Honda, a little bit less clear. I've heard some rumors that they might have another battery electric. We'll see. And finally, um, it's worth noting that Honda also killed off its Insight, uh, the small subcompact five-door hatchback mild hybrid that was supposed to compete with the Prius at a lower price and never did anything of the sort. Poor thing never sold in a fraction of what it was supposed to. Been basically a big failure for Honda and one of the drivers that convinced them to move their hybrid efforts into mid-sized cars and probably larger vehicles beyond that. Uh, in the future, but RIP Honda Insight as well. What what will we be um, writing this story about next year, basically? Off the top of my head, the two I can think of are the Honda CRZ and the Honda Civic Hybrid, which mm -hmm. use the same system as the Insight. I think that whole system is going away. It's already been replaced in Japan, so my bet is those two have a year of life, maybe two at the most. Nelson? Uh, I would look at Infinity's lineup and see what's going on there because it has a zombie currently in its lineup uh, that, that just gained a new name that it was never supposed to gain. Uh, and the car that it breaks the rules of the new naming convention. I, I don't know if the names are going to die or if the cars are going to die or what's going to happen, but we're going to be writing something about Infinity next year, I think, when it comes to filling up this particular set of column inches. <laughs> 